Welcome to the Environmental Show. I'm your host, Chris Cristitiello. The Newton Conservators and the Green Decade Coalition are taking turns producing a monthly show on environmental issues of importance to Newton residents. The Newton Conservators are dedicated to preserving open space for public use and enjoyment. On today's show, we're going to take a close look at nature in Cold Spring Park with the help of two professional naturalists. Cold Spring Park in Newton Highlands is a natural delight, a 67-acre preserve to wander through and enjoy in many ways. It's a beautiful place for ball games, walking, running, and using the exercise trail. It's also an excellent place to learn a lot about nature. Bring your curiosity and come along with us. We'll look at several aspects of Cold Spring Park the way a naturalist does. We'll look at the plants and birds in different seasons. We'll look at the wetlands and the habitat they offer for flora and fauna. We'll see how this area has changed over the years but managed to remain an oasis, a precious open space in the midst of dense suburbia. What makes this park special? Here we have uh, Dan Perlman, who is an expert on the history and the background of Cold Spring, where we are this morning. Uh, Dan is an um, assistant professor of biology at Brandeis University, and he's the director of the Department of Environmental Studies. Good morning, Dan. Good morning, Chris. Yeah. We have uh, a spot here that I understand you have uh, photographed over the years and through the seasons. Would you like to tell us about that? Sure, sure. This is a spot that I've been coming to for about four and a half years. It's just a few minutes walk from my house. And every month, twice a month, I come here, I set up my tripod right about here, and I face these trees over here and take a picture of the red oak on the left the red maple on the right, the jewel weed in the front, and everything behind it. What I love about this spot is the fact that it is nothing special. It's just an ordinary place in an ordinary set of woods. And yet, by coming here twice a month, year after year, it has become very special to me. And the many people who walk by this place and see it as well, and have seen me give talks about it, like, like Chris, um, it's, I think it's become special to them as well. People will see me in the park and they'll stop me and say, oh, you know what's going on at your spot? I saw such and such plant coming up or something happened. And so it's, it's become a real place in the community where people connect with nature, and I know I have. In this spot, early in the spring, there's just nothing but bare earth. And then some of the first things that come up are there are three skunk cabbages coming up in the same spot every year. And shortly at that same time, basically, there are little, little violets. We see a few in here still, kind of buried underneath everything else. Shortly after that, we have the, the cinnamon ferns that come up. These are the remnants of those. And then we begin to have Canada Mayflower, tiny, little, beautiful little things, the state flower, they come up behind. And then pretty soon we get the knotweed. And the main component here is the jewelweed, or touch-me-not, that comes up. And some years it grows as high as the top of my chest. So all of this stuff comes up in different waves, going and coming. And throughout it all, we have the red oak on my right, the red maple on my left, and a nice, lovely piece of poison ivy growing up here. 
This is the part of Cold Spring that I refer to as Cottonwood Alley. Um, there are these gigantic cottonwoods growing here. Um, we don't have mature cottonwoods growing anywhere else in the park, um, just in this one spot. And as you can see, this one that we're coming up on now, for instance, is really quite a magnificent tree. It's very, very large. Dan, this is a remarkable spot. These cottonwoods are enormous trees. They must be going up a good 75 feet or more in the air. As I understand it, there's a, it's a species that grows near water. That's true, Chris. It, it does like water. It likes having its feet a little bit wet. Out west, they are one of the main trees that grow along rivers. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's interesting. These cottonwoods probably shouldn't be here. I've looked at some um, far, U.S. Forest Service maps, and they show that the range of the cottonwood is south and west of here. There is a bit that comes up the Connecticut River, but there shouldn't be any of these in eastern Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And Dan, why do they call them cottonwood? Well, in the springtime, the male cottonwood trees, they're actually male and female cottonwood trees, the male cottonwood trees send out their pollen, and the female cottonwood trees um, create little fruits that are covered with a fluff. And so this cottonwood alley in a good year will have a half an inch of white fluff all along the ground, very soft, very smooth, and, and you will see in certain areas the, the cotton blowing through the air. Yeah. But, the, but the mystery remains, how did these cottonwoods get here? I haven't heard from anybody. It looks to me like somebody must have planted them here. We don't know who, we don't know when. And the interesting thing is, even though these large trees are very happy growing here, there are no young cottonwoods in the area. On the other side of Cold Spring Park in the, the new swampy area, um, you do see some young cottonwoods, but I've never seen a single mm -hmm. seedling or sapling over here. Yeah. Dan, what are these evergreens? White pines, which were probably the most magnificent tree in all of New England when the Euro European settlers first came here. Um, some of the white pines that had been growing undisturbed for centuries were as much as five or even six feet in diameter. Just magnificent trees, um, some of them over 200 feet tall, and the very best of those were used by the British Navy as masts for their, their warships, and as such they were a very important strategic product because England had run out of all possible mm -hmm. mast trees, and so these were precious to them. What alien or non-native species have come into this area? One of the interesting things is when we look through a wooded area like Cold Spring, and Cold Spring, remember, was never completely cut. This is one of the rare areas around Boston that was never completely cut. Nonetheless, in a place like suburban Boston, probably a third of the plant species we see here, maybe even 40 percent, are not native because we've had so many hundreds of years of imports through the port. Underneath these white pines, Chris, over here, we have uh, a little white oak, and behind us over here we have, uh, looks to me like a black oak. And what's interesting here, there are a lot of oak trees in this forest. Um, what's interesting is we can see all kinds of leaf damage here. Clearly somebody has been eating all these leaves. And my guess is a lot of this damage happened earlier this summer because we've been having a very bad year for gypsy moths. Um, gypsy moths were imported to this country in the 1860s to start a silk moth industry. It failed miserably. Um, they were brought into Melrose and they escaped from the backyard of this Frenchman who brought them here. And they spread slowly at first, but um, they are now through kind of a, the entire northeast of the U.S. And they, they are tremendously damaging. And in an especially bad year, like I think it was 1981, they denuded all of Cold Spring. When you walked here in June, it looked like it was November. I remember. Do you remember the, the sound of that? Yes. What? <laughs> the droppings of the, uh, of the caterpillars eating were made a constant uh, sort of rain sound. As you exactly. Grown. Yes. A gentle rain mm, of caterpillar right, droppings. It was, it was truly amazing. Yeah. Here's another tree. Uh, looks like some sort of maple. And it, too, has some, something eating it. That's right. And I'm happy to see that this one is getting eaten, Chris. Because this, Why one, so? this one is actually a Norway maple. We can tell it's got a leaf that looks like the sugar maple, mm -hmm. but it has white sap when you break off a twig. Um, the Norway maple is not native, as you can guess from the name. 
and um, it's been very, very heavily planted as a street tree. We have many of them um, along our streets here in Newton. It was thought to be a very hardy street tree. It stood up well to salt and being covered, most of its roots covered with asphalt. Um, the problem is they've escaped into the woods mm -hmm. and it's now become one of the more prevalent trees here in Cold Spring Park and it is pushing out native trees. Yeah. So Norway maple is considered a really nasty invader. What sort of other um, aliens are there that uh, are coming and in, in invading this park? There are many aliens in this park. We have some of the famous ones, um, purple loosestrife you mentioned yes. we were talking earlier. Um, which is a beautiful flower. It was brought in for the garden trade. There are still garden stores that sell it, but when it gets into a wetlands, it can take it over, again, pushing out the native species, not producing food and habitat for, for animals. Purple loosestrife garlic mustard, which is a little white flowered thing. When you crush the leaves, it smells like garlic. Um, we have calopanax, which I've never seen anywhere else. That's the spiny thing people might have seen walking mm -hmm. through the forest. This is a plant from Eurasia, Ilanthus, or the Tree of Heaven. This is the one that was written about in a book called A Tree Grows in Brooklyn. Japanese knotweed appears to be a pretty new invader on these shores as well. The multi-flowered rose is a very nasty plant, again brought in as a, uh, for gardens, and it escaped, and it takes over large areas of habitat. Buckthorn is becoming a real problem in many areas as it forms very dense thickets and it's hard to get rid of. All right, we're here at the entrance from the uh, Plymouth Road of the Cold Spring and looking down there, there looks as though there had been some moisture here at one time. Tell me about that, Dan. That's right, Chris. Looking at the old maps, it appears we're standing on the aqueduct, the Kachitawit aqueduct, and it appears that in this bend of the aqueduct, we can see in the old maps from the middle of the 1800s, they mark the spot where Cold Spring arises, and it's right in this bend. Mm -hmm. And so I think that what we're looking at down here is the site where Cold Spring is. Ah. Now, in the 1930s, when they filled in those ball fields, that's when they buried it, mm -hmm. put it in pipes. And, and so we can't see the, the spring much at all at this spot. Occasionally that wetness, I don't know if that wetness is leakage from the pipe or leakage from the, um, the aqueduct in some way, but that's, that's what we see. I, see. I notice there is a huge tree down here. Should I go home and get my chainsaw and come and get some firewood? <laughs> nice thought. Um, as, as an ecologist, what I love about the, the way the city leaves these down trees is this is wonderful habitat mm. for many different organisms. There are all kinds of small animals. There are insects that burrow in there parasites that live on the insects that burrow in there. So there are many, many different organisms that depend on downed wood just like this. And this may take decades to, to slowly decay. Um, and this is something I'd like to watch over the next number of years and see how it changes. Cold Spring Brook still runs through the park here, partly through underground pipes and partly at ground level where you can see the water flowing. The brook runs out through the Newton Cemetery past the library and City Hall to Bullows Pond. In addition to the brook, the park has vernal pools, and we're going to take a look at them with our experts. So, what are vernal pools? I'd like to introduce Dr. John Regison. He's in the Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Fisheries and Wildlife Service. He is also an expert on vernal pools and we've asked him to come here this morning to tell us whether this pool here in Cold Spring Park qualifies as a vernal pool. The experts like to debate uh, you know exactly how to define a vernal pool but to, to keep it very simple uh, it's essentially a pond or a pool that dries up occasionally so it doesn't support fish and if there aren't fish there uh, as predators, then a lot of insects and other invertebrates can occupy the vernal pool. And also many amphibians like to lay their eggs in vernal pools, again, because the eggs won't, won't be eaten by fish. So John, what is the history of vernal pools in Newton? Do we have pretty much the same number that we used to have or has it changed over time? Uh, 
Well, Dan, it seems pretty clear that there were at some at one point in time many more vernal pools uh, here in Newton, um, and many of which have presumably been filled in over the years. Um, because you don't have to go very far out to some of the outer suburbs uh, like Weston and Lincoln, and out there there are still hundreds uh, um, of vernal pools uh, in, in some of those towns, literally. And here in, in Newton, we have maybe a dozen or so uh, vernal pools left. Wow. Now, I understand that vernal pools are protected by law in the Commonwealth. And if we, if we were to draw a little perimeter around here to protect this, this vernal pool, would that be sufficient? for the organisms that live there, or what, what would we need to actually protect the organisms that live here? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, unfortunately, uh, it, it's not that simple uh, to protect uh, the vernal pool, because you're absolutely right that in Massachusetts, the actual pool, the wetland itself, uh, is very well protected. But many of the organisms, uh, the amphibians that are breeding in the vernal pool, are actually living in the forests around the vernal pool. Uh, so, for example, one of our most common um, pool breeding amphibians, the spotted salamander, uh, goes to the pool for a few weeks in the spring, and the rest of the year it's underground in the forests around the pool, and those animals can be living uh, easily uh, a thousand feet away from the pool at times. Uh, so they really need the forest around the pool, and that's one of the big uh, problems that we're facing today is that a lot of that forest land around the pool uh, is often being developed. So John, you found this creature under the board. Tell us about it. What do we have here? Well, this is a uh, diving beetle larvae, a diticid, and um, he's really only here because of the vernal pool uh, right next to us. Um, and again, you know, there are a lot of species that wouldn't be found in Cold Spring Park if it weren't for these vernal pools, because they really depend on the vernal pools during portions of their life cycle. And th this is a, actually going to turn into a large beetle. Now he was under the board. Would he have? Would he live there all through the year, or would he be in the water part of the time? Actually, the, these guys spend most of their time uh, in, in the water, um, but they actually um, migrate out of the pond uh, during times of year, um, and so so they, they'd actually be found in the water. And they're pretty uh, voracious predators, actually. Yeah, I can see the big mandibles there. Here at uh, a second uh, second vernal pool in Cold Spring Park, and uh, you can see that this one's quite a bit larger, and it has an open canopy. You know, there aren't trees shading the, the whole pond, and you can see that there's a lot more um, vegetation growing in this pond, grasses and things, uh, sedges growing in the pond itself, and that provides habitat for um, for a lot of the uh, invertebrates that are in here. Um, and, and for the, uh, the other uh, amphibians, like the American toads uh, and spring peepers. And uh, this pond has American toads, spring peepers, spotted salamanders, and wood frogs, uh, all, all using this pool during certain times of year. Now, does this pond dry up, or just occasionally some years? What, what's your experience with that? Yeah, I think this pond dries up occasionally in, in, in particularly dry years, but it doesn't dry every year. And as a result, there are some uh, organisms that need to stay uh, in water for two or more seasons that can survive here, that can't survive in, say, the other vernal pool that we first went to. For example, uh, dragonfly larvae, which grow quite big. Uh, they're in this pond, but not in the other one. Right. I remember as a kid, I would come down to this pond and, and see dragonflies, um, some, some of the larger ones included. And clearly, that diving beetle we saw would need uh, multi-years because it's overwintering as a larva, so it's going to have at least two, two summers um, to complete its life cycle. We're now going to look at some photos John has of vernal pool inhabitants. The spotted salamander, has, this is what their egg masses look like, and you can see that there's a gelatinous material uh, encasing the individual eggs and, and embryos, and this provides them some protection from um, predators such as uh, insects and, and beetles and things. The wood frog egg mass also has gelatinous material, but you can see that it has a rougher appearance. Both of these species breed very, very early in the spring 
because they want to make sure that their, their larvae will have time to mature before the pond dries up. And this is what a spotted salamander larva looks like. And you can see that it has gills, uh, feathery gills on the outside right behind its head. And um, unlike tadpoles, frog tadpoles, which have gills uh, inside their body. And this is um, when the spotted salamanders enter the breeding pond, the males deposit these white things called spermatophores. And these are gelatinous material that has the, has the sperm. Um, and if you'll go into a pond, you can sometimes see dozens, if not hundreds, of these spermatophores laid on the bottom of the pond. This is a redback salamander. And I wanted to point this species out because it's the most abundant salamander that we have here in our Newton parks, including Cold Spring Park. And it actually does not use vernal pools. This is a terrestrial salamander. And it lays its eggs um, in decaying logs. This is a giant water bug, and this one is a female carrying eggs. This species can be probably two inches long, and it also occurs in, in at least one of the vernal pools at Cold Spring. Thank you, John, for sharing your perspective with us today. Cold Spring is a wonderful place to watch for birds, and I'd like to show you some of them. I'm a retired physician, and birding has been a hobby of mine for many years. If you get up early enough in the morning, you can walk out into the park and hear the wonderful call of the wood thrush. Spring migration in late April and early May is a great time to see warblers. They're those small yellowish birds up in the treetops feeding on insects who have a variety of songs and a wonderful variety of plumage. This in particular is a prairie warbler. Another very common warbler that migrates through Cold Spring is the yellow rump warbler. There are actually some warblers that stop here and nest. And here is an example, a yellow warbler male and female, at the nest feeding the young. You can see the male yellow warbler with the reddish stripes on his breast feeding an open mouth. The best time to go searching for warblers is in the spring when they're all singing. You can identify them by voice as well as by plumage. If you wait until the fall, you encounter these same birds coming through on their way south, but their colors are much faded and they don't sing, so they're more difficult to identify. Here's another yellow bird that's often seen in the park, but it's not a warbler, it's a goldfinch. You can see from the characteristics of its beak that it's a seed eater. And you can often see it flying among the shrubbery and bushes, searching for seeds such as thistle seeds. Here's a downy woodpecker, seen year round in the park. Here he is in the process of making his hole. These birds breed in the park and you can hear their winging call all through the seasons. This is another woodpecker now commonly seen in Cold Spring Park. It's a southern species that's moved north into New England in the last two decades. It's called red-bellied, but in fact the red on its head is more prominent. The most common hawk in the area of Cold Spring is the red-tailed hawk. It uh, flies over the open fields searching for its prey in the form of rabbits, squirrels, or mice. And you can often see it perched on a limb in a tree, viewing the land with its sharp eyes. A colorful bird that's seen in your backyard but also comes to Cold Spring is the blue jay. This is a noisy bird that sometimes hunts in groups of three or four at a time. It's quite omnivorous, it feeds on insects and berries and other birds' eggs. Another very colorful bird is the cardinal. Here's a, an example of a male cardinal, a bird with a wonderful song, and the great color adds to the fun of bird watching. If you watch carefully in May or June, you may see the male wood duck and the female with chicks swimming around and the bodies of water on the eastern side of the park. 
Here we are in December at the annual Christmas bird count. Small groups of birders go out all over the greater Boston area and report the types and numbers of birds they see. With us today are Sam Jaffe, a biology student at Brown University. We also have Leon Hartnett and Pete Gilmore, both veteran birders from Newton. Here the birders are using the technique of pishing, trying to get the birds to respond, to come out and be counted. These experienced bird watchers are somewhat excited because of the unusual view of two red-tailed hawks in the same tree at the same time. Here they're seeing a belted kingfisher still lingering here in the park in December. That's a downy woodpecker you hear pecking on the tree. Of course you can hear them without any notes. There's something to watch and enjoy in every season at Cold Spring Park. Spring brings the first signs of plants growing and migrating birds returning. Summer is luxuriant with greenery and flowers, butterflies and birds. In the autumn, leaves burst into a glorious display of color before falling back to earth and opening wider vistas through the unadorned branches and limbs. In winter, nature at Cold Spring Park rests, except for some hardy evergreens, beautiful red berries that serve as food for the birds, skiers, and snowstorms. As we leave, we're grateful that this area has been preserved as open space. It's not a pristine forest or meadow. It has been affected by human intervention. New species of birds and plants, insects and amphibians have taken advantage of the changing habitats and have come to call Cold Spring Park home, even as other species have moved on or become endangered. This oasis in the middle of Newton is, in its way, a microcosm of what's happening to nature worldwide. And it's an important place to teach our children and remind ourselves of what we need to do to preserve our natural heritage. If you want to know more about the various parks and recreation areas in Newton, ask for the booklet called Walking Trails put out by the Newton Conservators. For information about the Newton Conservators programs dedicated to preserving open space in Newton for public use and enjoyment, please visit www.newtonconservators.org. Our website has lots of information about the natural history of our Newton Parks, together with all of its walking trails. It also has beautiful photographs and tells about the conservators' activities. And remember, you can order our walking trails booklet online. It shows the trails in all the parks. Each episode of The Environmental Show is repeated for a month on Tuesdays at 11.30 p.m., Wednesdays at 11.30 a.m., Thursdays 4 and 7.30 p.m., and Saturdays at 10 a.m.